This next two hours will be the absolute highlight of my year. I don't know how it's going to be for you, but I'm so incredibly excited because one year ago almost to the day, 22 amazing students started on this journey of doing their masters in HCI and they are culminating it today with their capstone presentations. And we are lucky enough to have their instructor here, Darren Dunenberg, who's going to say a few words in a few moments, as well as a bunch of capstone clients. So if you're a client, can I get you to stand up for just a quick second? Yes. Thank you. These awesome working professionals gave up all of their time, a lot of it, to work with our students, to instruct them, to mentor them, and to guide them. And so I hope that they know that today is as much a celebration of our students as it is of all of you. So thank you guys. Um, and so I will let Darren introduce uh, himself and the overall projects a little bit, and then we'll get started with our very first student group. Um, so I, I think the way that I would sum this up most of all is this has been an adventure. That is for sure. <laughs> Um, and it's everything that made it one is what has made it great. Um, I actually told some of our groups that I was thinking about creating a TV series around the adventures that they've had because that's, that's what it was like. There have been uh, highs and lows and there has been some drama and there have been uh, completions, there have been hurdles and all of it has been addressed and it's all been overcome. And the fact that we are here today is testimony to that, to their own perseverance and to all the students' abilities to tackle the problems that they are faced with and to address them and to do so successfully and end up with something great. And so I have also told them that today is their day to brag and their day to show off and their day to really revel in everything that they've done. Because at this point today, right now, is the result of a really <coughs> incredible, fulfilling, rewarding, and that's just for me. <laughs> so I can imagine how it's been for them. Uh, a rewarding adventure. So I would like to take this moment and tell them all how proud I am of them for everything that they've accomplished, all the meetings that we've had and all the deliverables they've had and the, and the, um, the testing they've had to do and the meetings they've had to have, have with their partners and everybody came through it very well and I just wanted to let them know that I'm very proud of them for what they've accomplished so a big hand for me to <laughs> and now I believe I am actually handing it back to me Jillian. right you know I, I like you all to listen to me as much as humanly possible okay so if you flip over if you have a handy agenda and you flip it over to the back side you will see, and if you don't have an agenda, I'll bring you one because you're Bonnie and I love you. Um, <laughs> you will see uh, the names of all of the students. We'll pass some more around in just a second. Um, the student uh, teams, their capstone partner, and so on. Each team's gonna talk for about 20 minutes. In an ideal world, we will not interrupt them too much while they've got their thing going, but there will be a little bit of time for questions for them um, after each of their presentations. And I actually just realized, I don't know how to pronounce your team's name. So we're just gonna call them Team Catalia Health, because I know how to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> and I am super excited to see them talk to you today about this amazing robotic assistant who's gonna keep us all healthier, and how they can simplify conversational UI to help patients manage their own health. So we have Jonte, Aisha, Charlene, and Stacy here today, and I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you. Oh, I am the master of this. This podium is me. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for that introduction, Jillian. Um, as she mentioned before, we're here to present to you about how a conversational UI helps patients manage multiple medications. 
So my name is Aisha Sheikh. I was one of the UX designers on the team. This is my partner Charlene Fan. She was also another UX designer on the team, John T. Williams as well. And then Stacey Saronic, who played the role of our project facilitator. And the most important member of our team is Mebu. And she's our personal wellness companion, and she's been designed and created by Dr. Corey Kidd, who is the CEO and founder of Catalia Health, and he's actually here with us today. So think about the last time that you visited a doctor with a problem. You probably went to the doctor and you told her that something's bothering you somewhere. She performed some type of diagnosis and then prescribed the medication to you and then called you back for a follow-up sometime later. So you go to your follow-up and then she asks you the golden question where you feel like you're being tested and the only answer you can tell her is a good answer. And so she asks you, did you take all of your medications at the times that you were supposed to take them? And you respond, yes, uh, I did, you know, because you don't want to say no, because she's worked hard to come up with a diagnosis for you and tell you what's wrong and then prescribe a set of uh, medications for you. So I was in a similar boat like a few months ago. I had the same exact conversation and I said, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I did take my medications. So she looked at me really concerned and she said that, Aisha, you know, if you haven't taken your medications, how do I know if the treatment plan that I'm giving you is actually working for you? If it's not working for you, then I can know to provide you a different set of medications. Or if that's not working for you, maybe I need to re-diagnose you altogether. So a similar bit more on a more grave scale, the half of the United States adult population, which is approximately 117 million people, are suffering from one or more chronic illnesses. And seven out of the 10 leading causes of death um, in the world have to do with managing a chronic illness. So this is like really serious stuff. One out of every two patients, which is 50% of patients, don't take the medications that they've been prescribed. And to make that a little quantifiable, $100 billion a year is lost because of poor adherence to medication. That could have been used to provide better health care or fund a research for more viable cures. So how can design introduce empathy into healthcare for patients? Well, Dr. Kidd has attempted to answer that question with Catalia Health in the form of Mebu. So Mebu is a personal wellness companion. She's built on a platform of artificial intelligence and essentially what she does is help patients by empowering them to help manage their medications, help manage their health condition. And so Mebu is similar, you can think of her as something like Siri or Alexa, except she's so much more than that because she's, um, she has the ability to build relationships with people. So maybe Siri, you can, you can talk to her, but she won't remember what you said to her a week ago. So when you talk to her again, it's like a blank slate. But Mebu is like one of us. So if you know, Aaron tells me that he went skiing last weekend, uh, the next time I talk to him, I can actually ask him, hey, Aaron, you, know, you went skiing last weekend. How'd that go? So I mean, maybe we can potentially ask Aaron how skiing went and then say something like, well, I wish, you know, I've never gone skiing before because I don't have legs, but you know, <laughs> that's a really nice experience. So um, as a part of that, Dr. Kidd's team is continuing to research how can we motivate patients to remain adherent to their medication plan. And as a part of that, maybe we've already built and she already has a database of conversations. So our team was approached to extend her intelligence. And our ask was that how can we help patients with chronic or terminal illnesses manage multiple medications? So maybe was already helping patients right now do a few medications, but the complexity when it's more than five, 10, 20 different medications exponentially grows. Now if you're a patient and you have some type of chronic illness, you might be battling a few different conditions, and at any given time you're taking five, 10, 20 different medications, it's really hard to keep up. So imagine that the patient is already juggling the number of medications they need to take. They're juggling when to take them, actually taking them, and then remembering if they took them so they don't take them again. But in, uh, above and beyond that, they're managing the side effects of all these medications, the drug interactions of taking 20 different medications at the same time, and then also, their more, most importantly, their mental and emotional well-being. So this is a really serious issue for patients. So as a part of the ask that we were provided by Dr. Corey Kidd, we were asked to define uh, four different types of scenarios or conversation types. The very first one was onboarding conversations. So essentially, you have 20 different medications, you need to teach them to Mebu so she knows what your, what your you know, medications are, what she needs to help you with. 
And so that, that conversation could be like, well, maybe says, you know, what medications are you taking? And you answer, uh, well, the first one is lisinopril. I take 10 mg, I take it at 9 a.m., 6 p.m., and I have to take it with dinner. And so now we go one by one and teach her all the medications that you have. It's a possibility that way. Or the doctor could teach her the medications in advance or someone else can teach her those. The second conversation is the medication reminder. So now that maybe knows all the 20 different medications you take, she needs some set of words to talk to you and say basically, hey, you know, Nadia, it's time for you to take your lisinopril. Have you taken it yet? The third type of conversation is uh, the medication adherence conversation. So for example, you know, maybe we ask Nadia that, did you take your lisinopril? And uh, Nadia says, oh, no, I haven't. You know, like, remind me again in five minutes. And then maybe we ask again, come on, Nadia. Um, <laughs> have you taken your medication yet? She won't say that. But, um, and then maybe Nadia's like, oh, no, just, just give me like two more minutes and I'm going to take it. Well, maybe it doesn't want to be, you know, your annoying sibling. So she's not going to keep asking you over and over. She's going to then, you know, wait and then come back to you. Because she still needs to know, did you actually take the medication you're supposed to take? So maybe a few hours later she asks, were you able to take that medication? And the patient says no. And then maybe we'll ask why. And sometimes patients say things like, well, I wasn't feeling well. Or I didn't want to deal with the side effects. So the fourth type of conversation now is, are there any changes to your medication plan? So now you have 20 medications, and maybe it was helping you, you're helping your life with reminding you which medications you need to take, asking you about the side effects, symptoms, but one of those medications changes. So now she doesn't know to ask you about that 10 mg pill that you're taking, well you're taking 5 mg now. Or maybe you were taking 20, and you don't take three of those anymore. So this conversation would be to account for that. So armed with all of this information, we hit the ground running and started our research phase. We designed a set of open-ended conversations to ask three different types of people, patients, pharmacists, and care providers. So we could get a different perspective of the patient's entire experience while managing multiple medications. Now the insights were really profound, to say the very least. We, we interviewed, um, we had 102 participants. Uh, minimum age was 18, all the way up to 70 years old, and most of our patients were uh, in you know, the later years of their lives, mid-40s and above, and they said a bunch of interesting things. We asked them questions like, uh, what do you refer to your medications as? Because you know, maybe she, she doesn't want to be boring and say, hey, did you take your lisinopril? If you're calling your lisinopril, you know, your, your blood pressure medication, your cool medication, your it feels good medication. So whatever that naming convention is, we were trying to learn from patients. Then we also asked her, uh, so patients responded back and they said that, well, I like to call it my red blue pill or I like to call it my thyroid pill, things like that. We asked them, how do you remember to take all your medications? And they said, well, some of us, um, you know, some of them were tying it to activities. So they knew when to take it during breakfast, when they watched their favorite soap, you know, big brother, um, when they, you know, went to, went to dinner, when they went to bed. And then some of them were remembering their medications depending on where they put them, like next to their toothbrush, on their desk, by their night table. And then um, we asked them, well, what happens when you forget your medication? Usually, why does that happen? And so they answered, well, um, I went traveling. I, I wasn't on my routine. You know, that day I didn't go to work. Um, or I just simply forgot. And then we asked them, um, so what happens when you didn't forget to take your medication, but you just didn't take it? And so they responded with things like, well, sometimes I know that my side effect is gonna make me you know, puke for the next three hours. So I'm hesitant to take it, and that's why sometimes I don't wanna take my medications. Now, so we get all this information, and it's just so, so complex, and we don't really know what to do. And we told this to Corey, too. We were like, Corey, this, 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 there's so many different variables going on here. We're, there's, we're, we're not even creating you know, like some travel app we're actually trying to help patients manage their health. So it's like serious stuff. How do we approach this design? So at the time, I read a book by a design leader called John Maida, and he talked about um, simplicity versus complexity. And essentially, we're always thinking about, oh, let's take everything that's complex and let's simplify it, simplify it, simplify it. But what he, what he said resonated with our team and became the guiding vision for us was that a little bit of both is necessary. So you don't want to simplify everything, uh, simplify the complexity completely, but you do need to know what pieces of complexity you need to keep. And so that became our guiding light for um, how we would approach the design of the conversations. And then um, the three main principles that we kept in mind were relevance. Uh, we wanted to make sure that whenever Mabu talks to somebody, that she's on topic. She's, she's only talking about the things that are important at that point in time and making sure that the conversation doesn't go you know, off on a tangent and turns into like a 10 minute long conversation. The next thing was learnability. 
The conversations needed to be easy. She needed to talk in a way that most people can understand what she's talking about and also follow along and then know that, well, I typically know what Mabu's gonna ask me, so let me think about those answers already. And the last one was personality. So um, Mabu has a very personable personality. She's witty, she's funny, and she tailors her conversations to different types of personalities, so we needed to account for that. So now my partner, Stacy is gonna talk more about how those conversations help patients manage multiple medications. Do you want to keep clicking? Oh, yeah. You want me to keep clicking? I'll keep it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the first conversation that we started with working on was the onboarding conversation, which as Aisha mentioned is the way that Mabel learns all about what medications you're taking. And it's really just the basics. Um, it's what are you taking? How much are you taking it? Um, what are the, uh, what are the uh, dosaging? What time do you take it? Are there any special instructions? Um, as we kept learning, as we kept interviewing patients and learning new things and new little insights, some patients would have food-based uh, dependencies for their medications. They have to eat 30 minutes before taking the pill. They have to eat three hours after taking the pill. Um, things like pills that, medications that are only taken once a week. As we kept uncovering these things, we just kept tacking these questions on to the onboarding conversation. Uh, but, and before we knew it, that conversation was so bloated and so long and did not necessarily, um, was not necessarily tailored to the, to the patient, really. It was asking questions that were Ill irrelevant sometimes. Um, so we modularized. We cut this conversation down to about half as long as it was at one point. So it was just the basics. What are you taking? How much are you taking it? When are you taking it? Any special instructions I need to know about? No? Nope? Great. Next one. And that's the whole conversation. If you wanted to set up reminders, and I'm going to chat briefly about the rest of what I'm saying right now in a second, um, those conversations could happen right then and there. Or the patient could say, that's it, I just want to tell you what I'm doing, and now I have an appointment, we'll chat later, maybe. So the medication reminders conversation uh, was one of the original four we were asked to make, as Aisha mentioned. And this conversation is pretty basic. It really is the, hey Aisha, it's time to take your lisinopril. Um, if you, and, and patients can set up specific reminders. So if I tell Mabu in the onboarding conversation that I take lisinopril at 9 a.m. and I don't set up a specific reminder, the default is she's gonna remind me tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. It's time to take your lisinopril. But I can say, well, but I wanna be reminded at 8.50 and 9.15 every day, in addition to 9 a.m. So that's, Part of what, this, what uh, the medication reminder conversation can do is tell you, hey, hey Aisha, it's 9.15, it's time to take your lisinopril. Medication adherence, uh, this is a conversation that's very, very simple and is not necessary in all, in all cases. So let's say for argument's sake, uh, it's 9.15 a.m., Mabu says, Aisha, it's time to take your lisinopril. And Aisha says, yep, I'm on it. Okay. As far as Mabu knows, that means she took it, but she hasn't gotten that confirmation. So at some point later in the day, depending on whether this, this medication is taken late, you know, again that day or not, so it might be in an hour, it might be in three hours. Hey Aisha, were you able to take your lisinopril earlier today? Yes, I was, great. I'll mark that down in your health diary. That's all that that conversation is. If she says no, I wasn't, um, depending on that medication, so if it's one that's only taken once a day, it doesn't really matter when it's taken, then I, Mabu can say, okay, why don't you take it now? Um, or if it's a medication that's taken four times a day, she may say, maybe we should wait to the next dose, depending on what it is. Uh, medication plan changes. So as Aisha mentioned, this is, for those situations when you're taking 15 medications, and you need to let, let Mabu know that a dosing has changed, the time you take a medication has changed, you have a whole new medication you need to take, or you've stopped taking one. Um, and the way we built this conversation was in two ways. So we built it so that Mabu could initiate the conversation in the event that she is actually in direct contact with your care team, um, and some patients have that, so that uh, Mabu's information is all being pushed to the care team via um, a, a, a cloud, basically, of, of data that's very secure, uh, HIPAA compliant, and all of that good, good jazz. Um, but not all patients are in that boat. So for those that are, Mabu has the ability to say, hey, I know you saw Dr. Schmidt today, and he increased your lisinopril. 
uh, just want to let you know that I'm aware of that and I'll, I'll, I'll change your reminder. But if your, care, if your care team isn't connected to your Mabu like that, then there is the ability for you to say, hey Mabu, I saw my doctor today, my lisinopril dosage changed. Great, tell me what's going on now. This is the uh, personalized medication reminders I mentioned earlier. Again, not necessary uh, that patients go even go through this conversation. If I say I take lisinopril at 915, and I don't want to have this conversation and set up specific reminders, she's just going to remind me at 915. But I could say, <coughs> but I also want to be reminded at 850 and 930, and actually I know myself, and I probably am not going to take it until noon, so tell, remind me again at 1145. This is actually the medication group names um, on paper, if any of these conversations were ever printed on paper, uh, would be the smallest, shortest conversation. And it's a dynamic conversation. And it only happens when there's a need to. So for example, um, Aisha tells Mibu that she takes 17 pills, and she says that four of them she takes between 9 and 9.30 every morning. Uh, Mabu is going to then say, hey Aisha, I noticed you take four medications between 9 and 9.30. Would you like to take them all at 9.15 and I'll, tell, I'll, I'll call them your morning pills so that I don't have to name, list them out each time. And Aisha has the opportunity to say, yeah, great, sounds good to me. Or eh, morning pills, that doesn't really resonate with me. Can we call them my awesome pills? Yeah, great, we can do that. Or she can say, I'm not really sure what you're talking about, Mabu. Can you say more about this? Mabu can explain what, she, what the concept of a medication group is, why it might be helpful. Um, or she can say, yeah, I'm not interested. Just keep listing them all out. We're good. This is medication, patient inquires about a medication group. So perhaps I have pre-dementia or some other memory loss, um, and I don't remember what's in my awesome pill group. It's been three weeks since I set up my Mabu, and it's nine in the morning, and Mabu says, hey Stacy, it's time to take your awesome pills. Great, Mabu, what are my awesome pills again? That's all this conversation is. She can tell you what's in that group. Mabu reminds patients for meals. Uh, so in our research, we came across a number of patients who had medications they were taking that were dependent on food. Either they had to eat food, they absolutely couldn't eat food, some specific amount of time around the medication, where they couldn't eat a specific food, no grapefruit allowed. Um, and so for those patients, they mentioned wanting to not only be reminded to take the medication, but to eat also, because it's that important that they eat at the right time in tandem with taking the medication at the right time. But there were also patients who had no meal-based specifications for their medications, and when asked, would, would this, something like this maybe be valuable to you? So, uh, many of them, men mostly, I don't know what that means, but would say, yeah, that'd be awesome. Please remind me to eat because I just kind of forget. Um, these, I'm gonna go quickly through a couple of these slides. So we had a really interesting visual, visual design challenge. My colleague Jante did a wonderful job working with a, an interface that was really not very visual. As you can see, Mabu holds this little tablet, and on that tablet is going to be text buttons that are the answers that you can, that you can talk, and it's also gonna show you in text what she's saying. But there's, it's really not meant to be something pretty and something to watch. It's meant to be a part of the conversation. So part of our challenge was, is there a way that we can use this tablet in service to these conversations? Is there a way that this can be valuable um, so this was one of the ideas that Jante had, um, which is the patient says, what, what am I taking? What's in my awesome pills? She would be able to show a picture of all the medications you're taking, what is it called, what are, what are your dosages, when do you take it? Um, they could ask, what is in a specific group? She'll show you just what's in that group. Um, and you can switch. If you have two groups, maybe you have your breakfast meds and your dinner meds. That's what you call your two groups. You can see what's, see a, a visual representation of what those pills look like. And some patients that we came across um, either speak with a very heavy accent or uh, 
just are, can be difficult, it can be difficult for maybe to understand what they're saying for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't have a tongue anymore due to cancer or some other speech impediment. Uh, for those folks, it's actually a lot easier to then type in the medication names. So we suggested using an autocomplete that the patient could kind of start typing in and the tablet would say, do you mean Digoxin or Digitech? Um, and the patient can say, ah, Digitech or Darvon, as the case may end up at VA. And then she can show you a picture and say, Darvon, is this what you're, what you're talking about? Yep, that's the one. So we've talked about what our challenge was and the solution we built and the impact on a patient's well-being. But the important thing to consider is the role of, in all this, of design. There's many solutions out there when we were initially researching the problem area and we found out that there was a lot of apps out there that attempted to solve the problem but they were solving the wrong problem entirely or if they were solving the right problem, it was a symptom of the problem. So as designers, what our goal is is to try to get to the right why and then try to define the right problem as best we can. And then after we do that, we wanna make sure that we, write, we create the right solution and then we create the solution the right way. And in today's world, that's no less than a superpower. So uh, we want to thank you guys for taking your time and being here with us in, you know, live, sitting here and listening to us talk. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we want to give a special thanks to Dr. Corey Kidd. And um, no script loaded. Thank okay. you for making me amazing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we'd like to take a, take a second to thank Dr. Corey Kidd. He's been the perfect client. <laughs> he's been the perfect client, but not only that, he's been an inspirational mentor to us, and his team at Catalia Health has really invested a lot of time helping us with our capstone, even though I don't even think they signed up for this, right? <laughs> so, um, and then we'd really like to thank all of the UC Irvine MHCID faculty, staff, our cohort, Jillian especially, uh, just for taking us through the highs of the highs and lows of being a grad student, arming us with all this knowledge and the ability to come out here and present to you about something that we were passionate and really cool. And um, also want to thank Mrs. Fan because you have taken pictures of my slides and no one has done that before. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And I, I, uh, artificial intelligence my passion. I, I come from. A I'm a data architect from Microsoft, so this is my passion, and this is something truly. And I hear you say the cloud, yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jillian. So we are the team CID Square, two of us, and we are designing for instructional design. That meant for us was building the foundation for the Center for Instructional Design success through research, design, and user engagement strategies. So three out of every five professors that we spoke to here on the UCI campus have been involved with or taught an online or hybrid course. Knowing this, it takes massive amount of time and effort to create an online course. Cited that almost 40 hours can be spent for one hour of yeah. online instruction. Yeah. So knowing this, why aren't more professors <laughs> using the experts of instructional design? <laughs> Our professors are saying that it's very yeah. true. <laughs> so, I it is very true. true. <laughs> so knowing this, there are five misconceptions though that faculty have about working with instructional designers when designing online courses. My course will completely change. It minimizes the role of the instructor. They don't know my subject matter. Not everyone can use the instructional designers. Online student learning outcomes are less than face-to-face. -face. So to get ahead of these, the Center for the Instructional Design paired up with the MHCID program, and they wanted to strategically align the center's services with the university's mission to promote student and faculty excellence. So I have some faculty in the room that are now looking at me saying, where's the CID? <laughs> so the CID. The University of California, Irvine entrusts the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning with this mission to oversee these three divisions, specifically the Division for Teaching and Learning, make sure to provide the resources for the faculty to be successful in the classroom. 
So we actually spoke with an interview, the vice provost, and one of the things that he pointed out is this opportunity and this space that we have to educate the faculty on what the role of an instructional designer is. And then furthermore, to really emphasize that our faculty have experience. They are the experts in their field. So give them the space to really collaborate with each other and show what those best practices are. So under the new direction of Megan Linos, she approached the MHCID program and gave us this challenge and really said that the strategic mission of the CID was going to be targeted towards this audience. So how do we analyze the audience and get them the services that would fit the culture of UCI? So the four main things that they wanted to do were establish their presence on campus increase usage, and promote faculty engagement by becoming this hub, the hub, the, the service providers and these faculty excellent, excellent um, pr providers of their best practices. So the challenge that we accepted. So this was a multifaceted challenge, and throughout our entire project, we used our design, user-centered design practices to address them. So first, we're gonna strategically align the focus areas of the center to the university's mission based on the best practices of the field, what other universities were doing, and then what UCI faculty was asking for, and then our expertise to know what that actually meant for what was gonna fit the culture of UCI. We then took that knowledge as a part of our research and paired it with the design for the key features that would go to the website and use this website as a tool for the faculty to engage and contact the center. So when it comes to making the acquisition of knowledge in the classroom more efficient, effective, and appealing for students, instructional designers can simplify the content, they can personalize the learning, and then they can also introduce technologies into the classroom that will help the faculty show things that they wouldn't be able to show or demonstrate in any other way. So we really focused on the end user. So while the CID was our client, their client, or the end user, is the faculty. So they provide services to lecturers, postdoctoral students, TAs, graduate students, and really any staff that is gonna support undergraduate and graduate courses. So we kept this mental model in mind and really wanted to follow that perspective of the faculty and their objectives when they're in the classroom when we, kept, when we were designing. So we began with the needs analysis and we met with the CID team and we wanted to learn what they were looking for. We then launched our research with a review of the current innovations in instructional design. And what we found was that the key focus areas are faculty development, such as consulting and training workshops, digital learning for online programs and course development, and faculty learning communities, which is that hub that the CID wants to be. And that's where the faculty can meet with each other and share the pedagogical innovations that they're encountering. Um, so the findings of the current literature are also being utilized at other universities as well. So we, we found 10 universities that have similar centers to the CID, and we use a competitive analysis to focus on the strategic goals of the centers, uh, the services and programs that they offer, the key issues and themes, and then we looked at how the centers align themselves in terms of pedagogy and technology. And then the services and alignment um, of these other groups can help the CID understand where they want to exist in this arena. So while we were doing the competitive analysis, the CID team also had some people doing a competitive analysis and we merged our findings into uh, this matrix so we could see where there were commonalities across all the universities and also where unique features existed. So we spoke to over 20 UCI faculty and staff and we used both uh, surveys and one-on-one -on -one interviews we delved into what services would be most beneficial and useful for them. We also spoke about their previous interactions with these instructional designers and what they could do to optimize that interaction to encourage more usage. Um, so based on these interviews, we found that professors believe that online courses need to imitate an in-person environment. And the instructional designers are experts on how to transition the course from in-person to online, to this new platform, and what interactions lend themselves to successful teaching and learning online. Uh, uh, we also found that the faculty would benefit from consultations targeted to specific areas of improvement. 
uh, since most of the most of the professors come with prior graduate teaching experience, <coughs> there is an opportunity to provide ongoing training rather than just a one-time uh, mandatory training. And when faculty run, run into questions, they Google it or they go to their peers. So this, the CID can build on this existing relationship, then the fa and the faculty can provide endorsements for the CID and their services. So this is the current CID website. It's very bare bones. It doesn't provide very much information about the breadth of, of offerings that they have. So, but this simple basis gave us a lot of room to explore the best way to present the CID. So we use the iterative process and a feedback loop to start broad, as we have here, with a lot of different options, um, and then hone in on what be, would be effective. Uh, as we ga gained insights, we refined these recommendations. And at this point, we learned that the client is limited to using a WordPress template in the UCI system. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so rather than do a full website design, we just focus on the key areas of importance for them. So the main goal of this website is to encourage faculty to connect with the department. So we designed a perpetual contact us button that would pop, and it would pop up after a few seconds to ensure a visibility of it and to show the, the CID's availability and willingness to be of assistance. The second goal of the website is to encourage event attendance. The current page is a Google Calendar. It doesn't have a month view and there's no registration. So, oh, too far. Um, but we want to match the mental model that people have of a calendar. Um, and we, help, we hope that this will become more aesthetically pleasing and easier to use. And by providing a registration option, the CID can encourage this event attendance by sending reminders to this busy faculty. So a user has six seconds to engage with the website and respond to a call to action. This is why we promoted team member availability and easy event registration. Perfect. So in regards to the strategy that we were then able to recommend, the following two models um, are models that tap into the outreaching from within the faculty departments themselves and look at making a department appointed representatives. Um, okay, so here. So these two models, um, having department appointed representatives and a train the trainer model, would operate off of this idea that Megan spoke about, that we already have trusted relationships within the departments. And professors look to their peers as instructional motivators. They know the subject matters and they know the tips on how to present it. So if we already go to them, then make them a department representative and use a train the trainer model to give them methodology, methodologies and best practices of instructional design that they could then offer to other people. So why does this matter? So the University of California Irvine has set forth a bold strategic plan based on four pillars. The second of which is first in class. So this is really focused on a really in elevating and increasing the student experience in order to prepare our leaders of the future. So that second pillar is looking at the fact that UCI is a comprehensive research university. As a comprehensive research university that focuses on student growth and they can do that by fostering excellence in teaching and innovation in the classroom and then utilizing the modern technolog technological tools to create that most effective learning environment for personalized learning for the students. So the Center for Instructional Design lives at the intersection of these two in pillar number two. Given this, we are celebrating this week that UCI has been named ninth in the top 10 nation's public universities. So congratulations to UCI, but we're also keeping in mind that in order to continue that growth, the utilization of the CID by the entire faculty is gonna be critical because that's a win for the entire university. And the more that the faculty can be successful in the classroom, the more that UCI is gonna be a sought after place for the most motivated and ambitious students. So with that, let's get to the top three. So we'd like to give a special thanks to our CID partners, our MHCID mentors, and all the faculty and staff who helped us with our surveys. And to all the faculty in the room, don't forget, contact the CID. <laughs> <laughs> Alright.
team Accenture, and unsurprisingly, we were tasked for our capstone to work with Accenture Labs. We got to work with wine, which is great because it's like being a bartender for technology. Uh, Felicia Wang was a designer and she was in charge of our processes. Aaron Soto was a researcher and he was our user testing lead. Steve No, he was our design lead. Katie Jones was our research lead and content wizard. And I'm Tim George, I was a researcher and I was our product manager. Bear with me for a second because it's about to get a tiny bit confusing for you guys. Um, <laughs> we had two clients at Accenture Labs and they were both na named David Wynn. <laughs> to clear this up, we went by David and Dave. David didn't want to be here today. He decided it was a better idea to be in Maui at the UbiComp conference. And as you can see, it's not working out very well for him. <laughs> Dave is here. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate you. For those who don't know, Accenture Labs is a group of around 400 people who act as the research arm of Accenture's consulting group. They provide research that informs thought leadership for around 411,000 employees globally. We weren't given a specific direction for this project other than that Accenture was trying to innovate in the cross-sectional areas of wine and technology, which was great because we had an extremely open-ended ask but this was horrible because we had an extremely open-ended ask. <laughs> we were not given a specific problem to solve, so instead of trying to solve one, we started asking questions. We were trying to formulate a solution, so we started asking, why do people even drink wine? What should we do about it if we even knew why they drink wine? And finally, how would we create, a, how would we create the solution that we decided we needed to build? So let's get started, shall we? Why do people drink wine? We wanted to understand deep motivations behind drinking wine. How did people get exposed to wine? Who were they with? How did they feel while they were drinking wine? In addition, we broke up basic customer needs into three categories, functional, social, and emotional needs. We wanted to move past basic functional needs and dig at the emotional needs associated with wine as well as the social needs. So we could use those social and emotional needs as a basic to drive our product. <coughs> According to the Harvard Business Review, emotionally connected customers deliver 52% more value over a lifetime over customers who lack an emotional connection to a product or design. To find the answers, we set up semi-structured interviews. Early in our research, we identified through market reports that millennials are drinking about 40% of the wine supply in the United States, more than any other generation. They also present a good market to launch a technology product in. So we focused our interviews primarily on millennials. We asked open-ended questions that dug at memories of experiences with wine. What was the occasion? Who were they with? How did drinking wine make them feel? We kept interviewing people until we reached some level of saturation. In other words, we're getting the same answers to the same questions we were hearing, just different people giving us those answers. <coughs> We organized our insights from the interviews into themes. All in all, we were tracking about 50 themes. Wow, that's a lot of information. But you can't design a breakthrough product based off of 50 loosely defined themes. What do you do with that? Our mentors at Accenture pointed us towards the jobs to be done framework. Just so we're all on the same page here, I'll explain what I mean by jobs to be done. It was developed by Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School. And this is a way to understand customer motivations by looking at the product as an employee and trying to discover what job the customer is hiring the product to accomplish. The quintessential example of examining jobs to be done is when a major fast food chain was trying to understand why they sold 50% of their milkshakes before 8 a.m. Through careful observation and interviewing their customers, they realized that every person buying a milkshake in the morning had a long commute to work, and they were hiring milkshakes to entertain them on their commute. This slightly different perspective on the problem helped them to understand customer motivations in a way that they were able to drive innovation. So we got our research team together in person. We locked ourselves in a room for about six hours, organized all our themes by functional, emotional, and social needs that they identified, and we found the primary job that people were hiring wine for. 
people were hiring wine to be confident in themselves. And this didn't really give us the whole picture. We wanted specific action items that we could design off of. We further organized our themes into six jobs we found the interviews had hired wine for. Let's walk through those. Consumers hire wine to express class status. Consumers hire wine to relax and feel special. Young adults hire wine to feel mature. Consumers hire wine to bring people together. Consumers hire wine to have something to talk about. And finally, enthusiasts hire wine knowledge to help them learn and grow. I'm going to go ahead and walk through one of these in detail. Uh, young adults hire wine to feel grown up. We call this our adulting job. <laughs> the idea here is that young adults hire wine to help them stop feeling like college students and start feeling like mature adults. A couple of the people we interviewed said they'd hosted wine and cheese parties uh, to do something more mature than usual for their friends. Another group told us, he, uh, another interviewee told us he felt there was a difference between beer, liquor, and wine parties because like beer parties were to relax, liquor parties were, as he said, to get crunk, <laughs> and wine parties were a mature environment where people would talk about boring things like politics. <laughs> Hiring wine to feel grown up has functional and social aspects, but we heard it primarily as an emotional job. What was fascinating about this job is that younger adults, like a 22-year-old that we interviewed, told us that he didn't really follow or drink wine, but that he expected to know about wine when he was older, just like his boss did. And it was interesting because he was making no actionable steps in that direction. <laughs> he didn't seem to have any desire to. So we, we latched onto that as a design opportunity based on this job. And I, I could actually do that for all six of these but we have a time limit. And so <laughs> if you want to go into those in detail, meet us at the table and we'll go through all of these for you. But I don't want to put everybody to sleep doing that six times right now. <laughs> but I will tell you these are fascinating lenses into customer behavior that gave us a lot of insights about the problems consumers face and some deep motivations that drive their decisions about something as trivial as, what should I drink on Tuesday night? All right, at this point we've learned some pretty compelling reasons why people drink wine. So the next big question we asked was, what can we create that addresses these motivations that people have around wine? Now I have to pause for a minute and explain that our team is remote. For most of our capstone project, our collaboration looked like this. Thanks for that picture, Katie. That's a great shirt I had on, <laughs> on a Tuesday night. But for brainstorming and ideating, being a distributed team is kind of a problem. There's just no replacing the energy and the buzz when a group gets together in one room, turns their cell phones off, and discusses the design possibilities. So we got together for a weekend long ideation session in person. We called it our design jam. We modeled the design jam after the Google design sprint as outlined in the Google Venture Sprint Book. Our goal here was to come up with as many good ideas as we could, pick the best ones, and then test them with live users. I won't go into the details of the entire process of this design jam here. Again, time. But we did take steps to make sure we we're coming up with ideas that directly related to customer jobs. If you want to hear some interesting stuff, come to our table later and ask us to explain pushes and pulls to you. And we'll, we'll dive into that in detail, but not right now. By the time the design jam was over, we prototyped and tested our five favorite ideas with a few wine drinkers. Turns out, some of our ideas really resonated with people, and we took those with us. But other ideas that we have, we could eliminate right out the gate, which we felt was a huge win on our side. The in-person session took us pretty far towards our big, what do we make question. But we hadn't done anything to refine our good ideas into one to really run with. So we started user testing again. Lots of user testing. Maybe too much user testing for this stage of our project. <laughs> we even wondered if we had done too much. We tested some prototypes. We did a competitive test to see how people engaged related wine web apps. We created storyboards 
to acknowledge how people reacted to those. And each of these moments, we were looking at what features resonated with people. And not just what features, but what combination of features resonated with people. What experiences were they looking for? We ended up with a long list of possible features that range from deliver wine to your door all the way back to pick the best wine for a group of people based on their flavor profiles. We eventually narrowed down our list to three things that millennials wanted out of a digital wine experience. They wanted something to connect them to their friends, that helped them learn about wine without putting out the effort themselves, <laughs> and that delivered personalized content about what wine they should try next. To pull it all together, we tweaked those findings into a product vision that could guide what we did next. We envisioned a platform to help you confidently discover new wines and grow with you as you explore your own palate. After this huge open-ended ask at the beginning of our project, we were pretty excited to have this much clarity about what to make that might actually address the issues of why people drink wine. We had enough direction to start bringing our product to life. Now, we understood why people drink wine, and we knew what to make. But how do you go about create, crafting that good experience. We started by defining a centralized goal for our product. What did we want the user to feel when they used our product? We'd heard from some of our most confident wine experts that experiencing wine is a journey. They drink wine because they love the hunt. They live to discover that next game-changing wine. We wanted to bring this journey to life for wine drinkers of all levels. We wanted novices and experts alike to explore confidently and chart their own path through the world of wine. We wanted the users to be wine scouts. So that's why we named our product, Wine Scout, which also left it a little bit open to interpretation. Is the user the wine scout, or is the product the wine scout? We're trying to make wine easy to access, so we included a feed on our home tab that encourages the user to embark on new journeys with wine. This offered us access to easy entry points to try new wines, input palate information, and stay current on what his friends are drinking. This gives the user a chance to explore, discover new things about wine, and about himself. We wanted the user to have a record of his discoveries and have a sense of progress. So we kept a profile for the user that visually displays his preferences. This profile also tracks what wines he's had and what he liked or didn't like about them. That way, if the user ended up drinking a bottle he didn't like, it parses that information as well, so the bottle isn't wasted. Every bottle is an adventure, and every adventure <coughs> is recorded. From our research and our previous user testing, we knew there was a pain point around people trying to purchase a wine bottle for an occasion or just find one that they'd enjoy. People are intimidated by the unknowns associated with purchasing a wine bottle they've never tried. In an effort to provide our user with guidance, we offered a two-pronged solution to this. The user can search for a bottle based off of his own profile to match with something he'd like, or he can use his phone to scan wine bottles. Say if he's in a store, he takes a picture of the label, and then it'll give him the same results with a match of how that matches his product profile, palette profile. At this point, we were really confident in our design, but we needed to verify that, we had that what we had created matched up with what we intended to create. So we brought it back to our users. Most importantly, we asked our users specific questions to validate while using WineScout that they felt confident discovering new wine and more eager to embark on their wine journey. We didn't get it right on the first try, or the second try, or the third try, actually. But through carefully scoped phases of user testing and design iteration, we created a final product that accomplished the goal we set out to achieve. Our final version of Wine Scout made the users feel like they were being guided on their wine journey, but they still felt like the adventure was their own. And we'd be remiss to deliver this information about our journey to you without recapping what impact it's had at Accenture Labs. Our research is going to be published by Accenture Labs as a thought leadership piece called Point of View, like the one shown here. We've also had a chance to share our research with two active beer and wine consulting teams. And now that I've brought you through this journey, I have to throw you one last curveball. I haven't actually been talking about how we developed a prototype that's the intersection of wine and technology. <laughs> it's been about human-computer interaction and design. 
We delivered, what we delivered to Accenture Labs was about one-third wine innovation and about two-thirds research and design process that Accenture Labs will use to drive innovation in markets beyond wine. We started, as many in our field do, not knowing what our problem really was. So we had to dig at it. And as any good researcher has experienced, we had to ask the question, why? And we had to get good answers to that question. This was our research phase. And we achieved this through market research, competitive analysis, semi-structured interviews, and using the jobs to be done framework to synthesize those interviews into actionable design guidelines. Then, when we finally got the answer, we had to step back and ask what? What do we do with this research? What should we make? This was our product design phase. We accomplished this phase through an intense design jam, iterative user testing that we used to define a product vision. Finally, we had to actually design a usable, and more importantly, a useful piece of technology. How? This was our interaction design phase. It was accomplished through a clearly defined scope, followed by purposeful user testing and thoughtfully scoped design iterations. We've had a great time. We've overcome a lot of challenges. And we're grateful to have worked with Dave, David, and Accenture Labs. And I also want to thank, of course, all of the faculty and staff at UCI, at least the ones that were tied to the HCID program. <laughs> uh, and shout outs to Super G. <laughs> and um, at this time, we'd also like to field any questions you guys have. Very great. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Talha. I'm Crystal. Uh, so a little, bit, uh, a little bit about us before we start. Uh, I have a uh, double major in film and psychology uh, and a master's in computer science. And I also have a degree in psychology and social behavior. And I have a background in design research from healthcare. And we're both uh, students in the HCID program here at UCI. <laughs> um, and we both have really big interests in the aerospace and automotive industries. Um, that has to do with transportation. So, um, which is why we were super excited to be able to work with Chris, uh, who's here as well as Leo, um, on uh, this project with MSC Software for our capstone project. And this is going to um, be a presentation about modern materials management. Um, you're probably wondering what that means, and I'll explain that in a second. But first, I want to give you a little bit of background on MSC first. Um, MSC originally launched back in 1965 when they won a contract with NASA to help engineers pioneer the way that they were going to be able to use computers um, to create, recreate test scenarios of engineering project designs um, and virtually, uh, to, virtually instead of doing them in real life. And what I mean by that is, uh, say for example, you work at BMW and you want to know what kind of safety glass would work best for the windshield. You could uh, go test a real BMW or uh, to collect the data you need, or, but with MSC software, you can now create a simulated version and crash that instead to get the same results. <laughs> this obviously has huge implications in terms of the saving time and money from a business perspective. Um, and now that you're collecting more data than ever before, what are you going to do with it? How do you store the data that uh, is not only expensive and proprietary, but also share quickly and securely across multiple teams within your organization. That's where Material Center comes in. It's a central place for businesses to keep all their materials data uh, in a place that they can centrally refer to when their engineering teams are building um, engineering projects. What I want you to think about is that it's like a recipe book for chefs in a restaurant kitchen. You need to make sure that your dishes are high quality, replicable and safe to eat. The on this only works if your entire team is on the same page and they know which ingredients are okay to use, why or why not. And as you can imagine, it's important for engineers to know everything they can about the materials that they're going to be using, what's available to them, when they're about to build something. I want you all for a moment to think about an apple as an ingredient in baking. I know this seems a little bit unrelated, but um, there are a lot of things that you have to consider when you're deciding whether or not you want to use this. What's the quality like? Is it fresh or is it rotten? 
Where did it come from? Washington or New York? What's the nutritional value of the apple? Where do I store it? Should it go in the refrigerator? What can I make with it? Can I make a pie? What temperature should I bake that at? The same considerations need to be made for materials. Um, for example, is the gold high quality? Where did it come from? What are its physical properties? Where should I store it securely? In a safe place? And can I use it in my satellite project? Materials data management works much in the same way, but instead of knowing if your apples came from Washington or New York, or needing to look up the ideal baking temperature for your pie at 175 degrees, we're working with ingredients that are kind of like the elasticity of plastics, um, the melting points of steel, the acoustics of ceramics, and the hardness of glass. And instead of chefs and sous chefs, we're using a recipe to bake a pie. Um, we have project managers and materials engineers building planes and rockets instead. Why is this important? Let me ask you all a question. How many of you came here on a plane today? Well, how many of you guys have ever had a flight delay due to a mechanical issue? Way more people. <laughs> um, well, that plane was made with materials that engineers tested first to ensure your safety. They wanted to make sure that the steel, ceramic, glass, all the parts that were used in the plane could withstand the harsh environmental conditions that are encountered during the flight. Because safety first, right? So um, I'm sure all of you might be wondering by now, what does Material Center look like? Um, Todd? All right, yeah. So uh, currently, Material Center has a lot of powerful features to help store, access, and visualize vast amounts of material data, data on materials. I'm going to show you a, free, a few screenshots of what Material Center currently looks like to give you an idea uh, uh, beforehand. Um, you'll notice that uh, when, when I go through these sites that uh, the pages are a little bit cluttered, uh, hard to read, and the different features are not as accessible as they should be. As a result, it ends up confusing how, uh, how to navigate through Material Center in an easy and understandable manner. Um, so here, is the, the main dashboard. And from here, in order to uh, search for a material, you click on the search tab at the top. Then from here, you have to click again into the material icon to actually get to the search page. So that's an additional uh, extra step. Uh, here, you have filtering on the left-hand side and then a easy search on the top uh, right. In the middle, you have uh, the view of all the materials in the database. Uh, you can also navigate through uh, this table uh, with a navigation tree on the left. And once you click inside of one of the materials, uh, then you get all of its different properties and uh, different uh, test data uh, in, in a separate table. So when we first worked with MSC, we asked, how can we help you guys make it better? We'll give you three wishes. And what they told us was, one, they wanted to increase customer satisfaction with a more seamless user interface. Second, they wanted to maintain a competitive edge against other similar software offered by the direct competitors in the same marketplace. And last but not least, they wanted to drive new business when presenting demos of Material Center um, in front of new clients. But we don't have backgrounds in engineering or material science, so for us, this was a whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> and like any good project, we wanted to better understand our users and the Material Center software itself. So we had to do a lot of research. So first we wanted to do some research to address these concerns by conducting a heuristic evaluation, competitive analysis, and usability testing with real users. We'll explain what these are in a little bit, um, but the plan was to spend the next three months in a research phase from April to June, and then take what we learned um, to design possible solutions from June to September. First thing we wanted to do was go to our users. So to find out who the people are who actually use Material Center at work, uh, we asked MSC to show us how the software is actually used by their customers. And then to tell us who some of their top clients are. And then we conducted some phone interviews with their users at Siemens Energy and the US Army, and we asked them, how do you usually use Material Center? How often do you use it? How can we improve Material Center for you? We took what we learned from them and constructed our idea of who the typical user of Material Center might be. 
So meet Dr. Brandon Lambeau. He is someone that we, is a typical, well, like most users, he's typically <coughs> an expert um, with an advanced college degree in material science or engineering. Um, and they typically specialize with working with specific materials on a daily basis. What we found was that there was a difference in perspective between um, the developers at Material Center and the people who actually use it. They're considered material science experts because they have advanced degrees, they know their materials really, really well, they're experts at it, and they're usually tech savvy because they use computers on a daily basis. But what these experts really want when they use Material Center is a seamless automated experience. And like we mentioned earlier, Material Center is an extremely powerful um, uh, program with lots of features and functionality. But for our project, we decided to focus on the primary task that engineers go uh, to do when uh, go into Material Center to do, which is searching. And searching is not uh, as simple as it sounds. Um, first, you need to find your way around the program that you're going to use um, and really learn what uh, tools are available to you within Material Center. Then once you do that, you need to decide what kind of search you want to do and then determine whether or not the search results that appear to you are relevant and what you're looking for. I want you to think of it kind of like shopping in a grocery store. Sometimes you know what food, sometimes you know you know you need food at home, but you're not really sure what you're looking for, but when you go to the grocery store, you know what you, uh, you'll need when you see it. Um, sometimes you know the general category of what you're looking for, so maybe you're like, you know, I need some fruit because I need to eat a little bit healthier. Um, so you head to the fruit section, and you head over there, and you kind of pick what you want. But then, um, the most common way that I think we all know about searching is kind of like a pinpointed search, which is knowing specifically what you're looking for. So on your grocery list, you know you need to go get apples, and so you're going to go specifically look for apples. We conducted a heuristic evaluation based on um, Nielsen's heuristics. Um, I'm sorry. Um, we, we did some additional research, and um, for our additional research methods for a heuristic evaluation, we used a heuristic evaluation based on Nielsen's established UX heuristics to develop a hypothesis for what we might find from user testing, which are summarized here. Um, they're essentially design guidelines or benchmarks to follow. Um, and basically, we wanted to help guide users their tasks with the software from beginning to end match their ex existing expectations of how software typically works elsewhere, give them freedom and flexibility to do what they want, however they want, when they want to in the program, reduce the amount of visual and mental overload that they have to deal with when they go through the program, make it aesthetically pleasing and keep it as simple as possible, and expect humans to be humans. Expect them to inevitably make mistakes in the program and help them figure out how to get themselves out of it. Tala is now going to go over uh, the results of our user testing. Yep, so our, uh, what we find, our user testing was a mixed method uh, where we had a moderator uh, guide three internal MSC employees with backgrounds in materials engineering through several uh, important tasks in a structured lab setting. Uh, so what we found, I'm going to kind of go through some of the, the findings. One was that uh, generally um, users weren't able to find some of the features or functionalities uh, throughout the program. So here, for example, uh, you can see that there is filtering on the left-hand side and <coughs> underneath each of the columns. While they are still, they're both there, uh, all three participants asked uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the session, where was filtering? It was right there, uh, but they weren't able to find it. Um, there is a lack of visual feedback throughout the program. Uh, here's one example where when you hover your mouse over uh, one of the mat uh, materials rows, uh, the mouse doesn't turn into the hand uh, click, which would signify that you can click into it. Uh, but it doesn't change uh, like that. Um, in general, uh, there is uh, a disconnect between how uh, users expect um, a program like Material Center to work with how they use other programs uh, uh, throughout the internet or other uh, pieces of software. So um, they were, there was one participant who was trying to find um, the exact value that they needed to, but they weren't able to, so they ended up using it uh, in a way that they know how, which was control F. Um, there was also a lot of redundancy throughout the program. Um, there's, uh, the, there's been a lot of user flexibility, but what ends up happening is that participants then feel overloaded. So you have multiple ways to go about doing the same thing. 
So here, for example, in the search home uh, screen, you have these uh, like nine, nine, ten uh, different icons that you can search by uh, in the in the search home. Uh, however, uh, you can do the same exact kind of search in the top right in the easy search. But if you look a little bit carefully, you'll notice that some of the icons here aren't matched down below, which makes it inconsistent. Uh, and then uh, looks matter. Um, the aesthetics generally overall uh, users found them to be cluttered um, and hard to read. Um, here's one example where um, participants were confused where uh, in the overarching uh, icons, uh, sometimes there were six icons there, but when you clicked onto another submenu, suddenly there were four. When you clicked on another submenu, now there are five icons. Where did some of the icons go? Um, another uh, finding we found was that uh, there was uh, not really a good way to uh, let the user know that they made a mistake and to correct from that error. Um, so <coughs> their material center itself has a back button, but because it's a web application, users ended up uh, clicking Chrome, the browser back button. And when that happened, they ended up logging out of the program and they didn't know how to get back. So overall, from the research findings, we found that the um, material center program is actually really, um, works really well. There isn't uh, a lot of major functionality issues. There aren't major bugs in the program. Um, users can usually get through uh, the program and do what they need to do. But um, what we would like to do is um, to help Material Center make design changes that were not going to be huge overarching changes, but something that they could actually implement in a way that um, would help Material Center streamline their um, user interface. So to do this, we set some design goals. We wanted it to be cleaner, leaner, and clearer, basically um, increasing the real estate space um, that they have available by um, better utilizing white space. Um, having more consistent iconography and a better layout, and streamlining some of the user flows in between the screens, and also um, cleaning up some of the copy language that's in the software itself. Right now, it kind of feels a little bit like this, <laughs> and we would like it to feel a little <coughs> bit more like this. So, um, Material Center, um, we, one of our other design goals was to create a style guide for Material Center. They actually never had one before, and this is kind of one of the reasons why there was a lot of inconsistency <coughs> across the design of the program. And so part, one of the things that we started with was to uh, propose a icon set that they could use with consistent line weights and better um, symbolism for the icons that go with the actions that follow when you click on these buttons. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to focus on was um, color usage. So what Material Center does a lot of time is um, they do a really great job of when they go to their clients, trying to, first they show a demo of the Material Center program with um, MSC branded colors. So the colors are red, gray, white, and black. And then the other thing they do is they customize the software look and feel to look l the way that their client's corporate color brands are with the logos and, and the coloring. So for example, Boeing or Ford, Ford is blue and white, they could possibly use one of these brand colors instead of the red. Um, another thing that we wanted to help them out with was um, currently Material Center uses a mix of Arial, Helvetica, and Verdana font. And this is a little bit uh, more traditional, and we wanted to update the font usage that they have across the, uh, the program. So we wanted to, um, we selected Lido Black and Lido Medium, and this is a more modern font. This is a, a Google font that's available across multiple platforms, and it's a free web font that they can use. Um, and um, we, from our research, um, when we did a competitive analysis, we wanted to do this because we wanted to see what other software um, in the same market space looks like um, in comparison to Material Center. Well, we found out that there w was um, there were more opportunities for these are their competitors right now. Um, Granta, Materiality, and IMA Limited are competitors that also work in the same material science space. Um, but what we found was that there were more opportunities for design um, inspiration from players outside of their immediate market landscape uh, for modern materials management. Um, 
The reason why we have Google, Amazon, and Excel here is because early internet usage strongly informs how people use computers. And most of us have a lot of experience with computers, wading through large amounts of information by conducting searches through Google, shopping on Amazon, and um, organizing, if, uh, organizing that data in Microsoft Excel. We went through several wireframes and design iterations, and we finally came up with this. And uh, Tal's going to walk you through a prototype of our design. Uh, yep, so if you guys remember uh, Brendan from uh, before, um, uh, he was uh, uh, asked by his coworker um, to uh, find a material that Brandon works with quite frequently. They asked him what the results of the last hardness test were. Uh, to double check, he doesn't really remember off the top of his head, um, so he wanted to do a quick search uh, to find out if the numbers were uh, correct. So he comes into here and types in uh, synthetic, Fluoro, Flogophyte. I think I got that right. <laughs> uh, and and uh, and enters. Uh, and he finds uh, <laughs> these results. But then he gets an email from his boss uh, asking to find a new material for a project that they're working on uh, with NASA. They want a, cer a ceramic or glass that is lightweight, resistant to heat, and does not corrode. So he Brandon goes into browse uh, to look under ceramics and glasses. Uh, here, um, he selects the, uh, the correct category, and then on the right, on the dashboard, uh, it updates um, uh, accordingly. So he gets the, the right material that he needs. Uh, he gets a follow-up uh, email saying that the material can't be a composite or a finish because it's too expensive and out of budget. So no problem, Brandon goes into the filter feature. And here, he deselects the composites and finishes. And again, uh, it updates in real time on the, on the right side. Now, we, he finds the material that he needs and, uh, so, and goes into it. Uh, here, uh, Brandon then finds the hardness uh, value that he needs and reports it back to his boss. So um, uh, the, we presented our, uh, our designs to uh, MSC, and they loved our feedback. It was well received. Um, they liked how we had a cleaner look and feel, it was more white space, it was more readable. Uh, the user flow was more streamlined, and that getting from one place to another made more, made, uh, more, more sense. And then uh, for the future, our prototype will serve as a basis for future releases in Material Center uh, as inspiration. Uh, the next steps uh, for MSC would be to apply our uh, style guide and uh, our uh, designs consistently across other screens to other aspects of Material Center to implement it into a, uh, a full test version of Material Center. Uh, make sure everything works on the back end once changes are implemented uh, with testing, go test, 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 and then launch, and then keep iterating and launch and keep iterating and launch. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Good afternoon. We're, we are proud to share with you the custom feature tool we designed. So I'm Devin Singh. I'm Deborah. I'm Magna Chef. I'm Todd. I'm Yen. And we are the defenders of UX. <laughs> so the concept of the feature is central to our project. So I'm going to talk about it now. Um, in industrial and mechanical engineering, um, <coughs> these engineers typically create models of digital products, or digital models of a product, product such as this before it's created. And the, re the reason they create digital <coughs> products is so that they can pressure test it um, for strength and integrity. So think about if this was a piece for a bridge, right? You'd want that tested before it's put in to use. So this testing process is actually made up of two steps. The first is called defeaturing. The second is meshing. The feature is the process of, of removing unneeded cutouts. So an, these little cutouts right here that are usually um, cutouts made for screws and fillets, those are called features. And the feature is removing these um, cutouts. So it goes from here to here. And then meshing <coughs> is when you add a mesh to that simplified geometry so that you can pressure test it. Our client was MSC, so it was the same company that Talon and Crystal um, worked with. 
who we worked with MSE Apex, which is a simulation software. One cool, um, well the main thing that MSE Apex does is that it, it defeatures, so it does this. But it does have a new tool called the custom defeature tool that handles unusual um, billets. So a standard, a standard feature looks like a circle like this. But these sometimes, if this is like the hull of a ship, you can see there's really unusual um, shapes there. And right now the market doesn't really support, there's nothing on the market that's, that can remove those type of features, these really unusual shapes. So enter the custom defeature tool. This is the current setup of the custom defeature tool. I'm gonna walk you through the typical user journey. Typically you would come in here and select the type of defeature tool you have, there's three of them. We focus on the custom defeature tool, so it's actually, actually highlighted right there. Next, the user would select auto or manual mode by selecting that line and ball at the top left. Auto mode is faster and automated, but it's less precise, and manual mode is more precise but slower. Then they would follow these steps. So the, cu the custom tool actually has these steps set up that you actually go through. The orange, the orange section is, is the current step that you're on. The pink step is previous steps. And then the red X's allows you to navigate back and forth. At the bottom, there are instructions that are nested. You have to click there, and it expands like an accordion. So there lies the problem. The custom defeature tool has never been tested for usability. Usability is important because defeaturing takes up seven to 75% of the testing process. Our goal was to improve the usability of this tool. So our process was four phases. First, we discovered the issue. Next, we defined the issue. We developed a solution and then delivered the solution. So Todd is going to walk you through how we discovered our issue. Cool. All right, so as you can see, we did four types of research. We did a contextual inquiry, cognitive walkthrough, competitive analysis, and usability testing. So we're first going to take a look at contextual inquiry. So one of the things we did is we had, we needed to learn this domain because we knew nothing about this domain. This was a really confusing, very technical domain. So we did some cognitive uh, interviews, contextual inquiry interviews. And we had the sales guys actually walk us through their demos to see how they're showing other people to use this. So some of the things that stood out to us when we were going through that process is these steps were really unclear. Even your sales guys were having some troubles going through and doing the demo. And they weren't really following the rules. They were just doing it straight from memory. They weren't even reading these. Uh, and there's also a lack of automation. They were having troubles with the automation process. So there were some challenges there. And then we went and did a cognitive walkthrough. We identified three core tasks that happened. So when people are deep featuring, they're using either manual mode or they're using auto mode. And then they have to move back and forth between the steps quite frequently to make changes. So each one of these tasks is made up of a series of steps. And when we did our cognitive walkthrough, we had all of our evaluators, evaluators do it from the perspective of a new user because so, they want to introduce this to more market. So we found that 9% of the steps for the manual passed and the rest of it failed when they did from that perspective. Uh, as well as the auto mode did very poorly in that. And only 12% of the steps passed and moving back and forth only 50% of the time did it pass. So our main issues were the auto mode is just not findable. People aren't, they're not understanding what that icon means. It has no context for them. And then as well as the defeature tool which Devin kind of pointed out, people are having troubles finding that and again, the unclear stops are just a consistent issue amongst, amongst things. Uh, we moved into the competitive analysis. We wanted to look at the market to see what else was out there, what people were doing, what other defeaturing tools had stuff going on. So we noticed that through these findings, the menu organization was much better than the competitors. So these are areas of opportunity for MSC to improve Apex. And then again, the, the steps just weren't giving enough feedback. So people were just not understanding the actual process. Enough. But the competitors did a really good job of kind of outlining that step-by-step -step process. Uh, we also did some usability testing. We went out and got some engineering students and some other people that use the software in MSC. And we actually watched them perform the tasks that we were, we were requiring them to do. So again, they had the same findings. Um, auto mode was rough and then unclear steps and jargon was causing issues for the engineering students. They weren't sure how to use it. We noticed also that the tolerances were becoming an issue. People weren't unsure. They were unsure what they were doing and they 
really didn't know how to use them with the tool itself. So, and then navigating back and forth between steps became a, was still an issue. So those were our four pieces of research. We did a constant comparative method to kind of boil it all down into a single, single itemized list of issues to resolve, and Eon's actually going to discuss that. So now I'm going to talk about key findings based on this research we conducted and Todd just mentioned. We use constant compare method to identify main issues, which we have regathered a whole big set of data and get up there, collect it, and then break it down into smaller pieces. So here is summary of issues. So first thing is auto manual mode. So auto manual mode is not findable and it doesn't look like clickable. And the feature tool also saying issue, it doesn't look like clickable and it's hard to find. And this progress bar. The clear step is not clear, and there is a lack of feedback regarding progress. And menu hierarchy. So menu is unorganized, and tolerance UI is not very easy to use. And navigating step is not clear. And I also I almost forgot this one is very hard to find, which I just almost forgot. <laughs> So overall, there's a lack of true automation, even though we use auto mode. So here is all the issues I just pointed out, and we color coded the old issues, and it tied into the solution, which we're gonna discuss in the next slides. So next, Debra is gonna talk about how we developed the solution. So as Eon mentioned that we summarize um, a lot of issues through the company we through and usability testing. So here we have uh, about seven issues you can see about you. If when you are real, uh, looking really close up, you can see there are three main um, areas, so uh, problematic areas. So that will be the fundability, the clarity, and also the efficiency of the tool. So we came up with a lot of ideas. Here are the um, like the two results we have, the both uh, the best ideas we came up with. So on the top, you can see we um, sort of designed the frame to structure, we organized the entire uh, tool panel. So it's based on the user behavior. We want to know what is, we have learned about how users use the tool. We know the flow, we know the process. So we want to be able to reorganize the entire tool into a more sensible and reasonable process. And further down, you can see the lightning bolt. The original interface, uh, it was clicking on the lightning bolt, but the icon was not obvious. So we designed it into a switch into the auto and manual mode, which makes it more easier and findable. And next one is the progress indicator and the clearly written steps indicator. So those two together is going to be step-by-step -step guiding the audience, um, I mean the users, step-by-step -step know where they are and what they're supposed to do. And the further down there um, is the easy to find tool tips. So along the side of each tool, we have this icon. So we want to make sure that people, when they have issues or questions, they can hover over the icon and a tool tip will show up. They will know what's going on. Um, so on the right sketch, you can see the tab modes at the top. Again, it's for organization, the hierarchy, the overall flow of the tool. So when user come into the featuring tool, they can choose from different tools. They know where the custom tool is, a uh, custom feature tool will be. And next one will be the geometry select, uh, selection indicator together with the easy to use slider of the setting. Um, so when those engineers, they are working, working with the model, they really want to be able to see it, to tune out the features they selected. So these designs will help them to visualize what's going on. And while they're sliding between the lens and the angle adjustment, they will really be able to see what's going on through the um, geometry selection indicator. And further down at the bottom, you will see the geometry library that will give you all the features that the um, engineers they work on, and everything will be there. Whenever you go come back, um, go to the next file and come back to this design, and you can find those things you've worked on before. So here are the wireframes. So without the inter interference of um, visual elements, we can clearly see the structure, the flow, again, the hierarchy. If this is um, the design is going to be a good idea, and then are they um, focusing on the user needs or are they based on uh, how the user behavior goes through the entire, uh, entire process? And after our discussion with our client, we came up with this two, um, the this is the merging result, the final wireframe of how we grab all the ideas from those two sketches. And 
the final visualized version of the mock-up tool. So again, based on our result, we want to be able to cater to users' needs and want to know what is their um, behavior, their flow, when they come into the feature tool. So on the top, again, the outer frame is to organize all the tools. It's straightforward. When users come into the uh, menu panel, they can know where the feature tool is. And between three different defeaturing uh, functions, they can quickly find out the custom defeature tool is right there, the tab modes at the top. And further down, because auto and manual is sometimes, uh, it's actually pretty much some, uh, something the engineers they use most often. So most of the time, they need to toggle it on the auto mode. So we put it as a switch. Switch button is easy for them to find as well. And then next is a progress indicator. And again, the clearly written step by step, we want to guide the uh, users uh, step by step, and they, they will know where they are and what they are supposed to do if they are not familiar with the software. And further down there, um, we have the, again, the, the, the new idea we come up with is a geometry library, which will help the users while they are working with the model, they know um, which features they are select, selecting, and while they are doing the adjustment, they can slide through the um, lens bar and the angle bar to do the adjustment. And whatever they work with, it will be saved into a geometry library. So, but these new designs are based on, um, based on our idea, our research of the user data, and then we want to be able to know if these new designs are really catered to users' needs. And so, Megdan is going to describe the um, result from the second competitive walkthrough. Thank you, Deborah. So, we used our first cognitive walkthrough as a benchmark on these three core tasks, and we. And we used, we used our second and we did our second cognitive walkthrough based on the same core task, core task on our solution. Um, as we can see, this, the pass rate drastically improved um, from 9% to 86%, from 12% to 100%, to 50%, from 50% to 100% again. Um, and the core task here in the gray are the ones that we did not compare because we, we did not test it but we also introduced new design, and so they did really well. They have 100% pass rate in all of them, except for which we out there, which is just 50%. Um, so this gave us two areas of opportunities or for improvement, which is uh, <coughs> removing custom features in manual mode, which is just 86%, and that was due to the term faces um, in it, and opening a tool tip, which was just 50% uh, pass rate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So in summation, we first discovered the issue with the contextual inquiry, the cognitive walkthrough, competitive analysis, and usability test. And we took the results from this and defined the issue using the constant comparative method. We developed a solution by sketching wireframe and then create a mock-up. And then we did a second cognitive walkthrough on our solution and compared the deltas between the first cognitive walkthrough and the second. So the existing custom to feature tool has many usability issues and scored poorly in the first cognitive in the, I'm sorry, the existing custom feature tool has many usability issues and scored poorly in the first cognitive walkthrough. Our solution addresses many of these usability issues and scored better in the cognitive walkthrough too. So, as Magna pointed out, these are two areas of opportunity moving forward. The first is, if you look at our, our, our solution here, um, clarifying what bases are. The, the word bases is, sounds kind of jargon, um, so we can improve the the understanding of that, either through the orange text here, the, the white text in this orange section, or in the tooltip right here, which, which is difficult to see, which is actually the second er area of opportunity, um, making these tooltips more visible. What I have here, finally, is on the left, the existing custom feature tool, and then our solution on the right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. My name is Brennan. <laughs> I'm Nadia. I'm said. Megan. I'm Rodka. And we are Team Muchi. So over the past six months, we've been working with our partner Pegasus um, to understand how we could design relationships within the hospitality industry. So today, we're going to go over um, our project very briefly. We'll show you guys our solution. And then uh, we'll go over a couple high-level takeaways from our project. So let's get started. Who is Pegasus? Pegasus Solutions is a travel technology company that's focused on the hospitality space. And the company is founded um, around 30 years ago. And they produced the first system that connects reservation systems with a global distributed network. 
So Pegasus powers over 100,000 hotels, and they provide these services to all of their clients. So things like digital marketing, reservation systems, business intelligence, and distribution services, et cetera. And at the beginning of this project, Pegasus was re-architecturing their software platform. So in their current model, they had a bunch of disparate modules that existed in different places. And what they wanted to do was bring all of those things together under one platform, which we are calling the hospitality platform. And while they were bringing all of these modules together under the hospitality platform, they also wanted to explore what a future module could look like. And so they challenged our team, Team Muchi, to come up with a way to improve relationships within the hospitality space. So what would this module be? Well, by talking to our partners at Pegasus, doing a little bit of user research and some market research, we identified some opportunities within the hospitality space and within the Pegasus platform that we wanted to pursue. So the first was that currently in the Pegasus platform, there was no way for internal users to communicate with each other. Um, hoteliers, uh, who are the primary users of this software, were using a mix of communication channels in order to accomplish their day-to-day -day goals, including you know, attending meetings, uh, communicating via email, and then also communicating through a physical bulletin board. Um, there was also, what we also found was there's nothing in the market that actually focused on internal relationships and internal communication within the hospitality industry. And then finally, we found that hoteliers use multiple systems to accomplish their day-to-day -day work. So based off of these opportunities, we came up with these three high-level goals. The first is to improve internal communication within the Pegasus platform. The second is to help Pegasus gain a competitive advantage over the other hospitality platforms that are within the hotel space. And then also, we really want to reduce context switching for our users. Um, and this is by integrating um, <laughs> Another kind of contact switching. <laughs> <laughs> contact switching. For a second, I thought that was actually an example. <laughs> <laughs> um, reducing the amount of contact switching that users have to do from software to software to accomplish their everyday uh, needs. So given all of these opportunities and potential areas, um, we embarked on our six month journey um, to uh, improving relationships within the hospitality industry. So now, uh, Nadia is gonna talk more about our process um, that we took to do that. Okay, so like Brennan just mentioned, we, uh, when we first started, we did some background and market research, just kind of get a lay of the land of what's currently out there for um, hospitality consumers uh, on the market and where we could kind of come in. Uh, then we engaged in user interviews with hospitality professionals. From there, we kind of started formulating ideas on like features of the relationship module, of the module. Um, and then from there, we kind of created user journeys, formed the information architecture, from there did user flows, all these ideas that we had, um, and from there that formed sort of the base of information to our development, <laughs> development phase where we started creating wireframes of these kind of ideas we had and iterated a lot on those with a lot of feedback from our partners. Um, eventually, we developed a interactive prototype to start with uh, usability testing. Um, and we conducted seven uh, remote moderated usability tests. And the moderated uh, test gave us a lot of feedback and insight into you know, what features really resonated with them. And because that's really kind of what we were getting at is what were they thinking they would actually want to use, what, might, what they might not use, uh, as well as also uh, testing the usability of it. And so with all that background, we would like to present to you the relationship module. Uh, the relationship module is kind of our solution to become a communication and information hub for uh, hospitality professionals within the Pegasus platform. Um, and it's comprised of three main sections, uh, an announcement section where uh, you know managers kind of come in and create and post uh, major announcements to their properties and um, even higher level ones can come to their chains and post announcements to the chains um, and events sort of calendar, we can have a list of events and um, also just a calendar view so you can uh, keep tabs on what's going on in your properties in one central location. And also a reputation section, which is where they can kind of get a high level overview of their analytics and social media reviews because this information uh, is really important to managers to monitor their properties. And so how does this sort of 
module work in context of a hospitality professional's life? Well, I will turn it over to Megan to give kind of a demonstration. All right, so we want to introduce you to our persona, Georgette. She's a general manager, and she has 15 years of hospitality experience. But as a general manager, they have a very high stress and hectic <coughs> job. They are overseeing all the day-to-day -day operations of the hotel, and they need to make sure that all of their staff are well informed of everything that's going on and ensuring a delivery of an excellent guest experience. So with this, we're gonna go through a day in the life of Georgette as a general manager. So Georgette receives a call from her area manager letting her know that there's gonna be a site inspection at her property and they weren't given a specific date or anything like that, it's just gonna come up soon. So she needs to make sure her entire staff is aware that this is happening so they can prepare. So before the relationship module, what she would have done was written up an email, sent it to her staff, and maybe that would have gotten read or maybe not. Another method would be putting it up on a physical bulletin board in the hotel staff room or mentioning it in a stand-up meeting. But the thing with that is hospitality is a 24-7 business, so that involves people needing to be physically present in order to get that information, and people may be missing vital things that they need to know in order to do their job. So with the relationship module, we have our announcements. And here in the announcements, we have a feed of all of the posts and information that has been going up, being posted by managers or whoever. And this replaces that physical bulletin board with a virtual one that is accessible at any time and any place. And all of these posts are easy to find if you need to see old ones that were posted in the past by using the search function up at the top or by filtering from who posted it or by the category, and those are things like revenue, general management, sales and marketing. There's also a bookmarking option so that they can save posts that they want to refer to later on. So Georgette will go ahead and create her post, and she's going to set the visibility of it, so she wants that to go to just her property so that they're aware, so it's targeting the audience. And then she can also set a category which she'll select for general, and this helps with filtering later on. And then the sticky option there makes it so that the post is pinned to the top of the page, so that'll be the first thing that people see when they log in. And then she'll write her announcement. This is meant to be really short and sweet, so we set a character tab of 500 on there so she can get in and out and go on with her day. So she posted about her uh, site inspection, she's gonna publish, and now it's there for everyone to see and they can refer back to it. <coughs> the other thing with general management is there's gonna be a lot of events going on at the property and she has a wedding coming up and this is a big deal because it involves a lot of different teams coordinating with each other. They need to make sure they all are on the same page in logistics and details. So she's gonna to go to our events section. Here at the top there's a calendar that shows the coming two weeks so that the most recent information is the most accessible. She can scroll to the date that she wants and then it'll show all the events for that day. Or she can directly click on the date in the calendar which will take you directly to that date. On the left hand side there's the same search and filter options as announcements and then she can create an event by clicking on the plus button. So here she'll just go ahead and fill out with the event name, with the wedding information. <laughs> She's gonna select a date and time, and then she'll also put in a location. So this is specific to the property. And then a description for any extra information that she thinks that everyone should be aware of. <laughs> All right, and we'll go ahead and publish. So these events, um, it's a great way for everyone to know and stay on the same page if things are, are coming up, and they can be crafted to however the property sees fit. So if it's a small boutique hotel, they can use this for things like weddings, small um, conferences that they're having on site. If it's a massive chain, they can be using this for corporate uh, events or anything that's happening like a company picnic. Uh, or it can even be used for local things happening around the property. So if a guest comes up to anyone, they can refer to this and see and then respond to that guest in real time. So we have announcements and events. This is great for internal communication, 
but we also wanted to focus on the relationship between the property as well as their guests. So we're gonna have Veronica uh, explain the reputation section. So right now, in order for Georgette to check the status of her properties, uh, customer service, marketing, and overall guest perception, she must check um, multiple social media sites and online travel agencies like TripAdvisor.com and Booking.com. Now, having to log into each account is cumbersome and time-consuming. Also, trying to make sense of the different data visualizations from site to site is overwhelming and really confusing. So now the reputation area addresses this issue by providing a one-stop aggregation of data from these external sites um, using APIs. The area contains three sections, which I will go over, uh, social media, OTAs, and fee uh, guest feedback. Now the social media section gives an overview of social media um, stats for specific properties. The section includes analytics from major social media sites such as Facebook and Twitter, separated by individual collapsible components. Each component includes statistics for data, such as how many likes, followers, or positive ratings the hotel received throughout whatever date, date range Georgette selects. She can also compare changes in each data set she selects over the past year to identify any trends. The OTA section features analytics from the online travel agencies, also known as OTAs, such as TripAdvisor.com and Booking.com, which they use most. And these types of websites provide a place for guests to review hotels they visit. Here, Georgette can see how her property is ranking on each OTA based on guest reviews. Guest reviews from OTAs are given serious attention by managers in the hospitality industry since negative reviews can drive business away and good reviews can bring new customers to stay at their properties. Weekly review scores are also readily displayed to monitor weekly changes. Now below that, the review score comparison provides Georgette two ways to, to quickly identify how her property's review scores compare to other hotel properties. In one area, she can see how her property compares to other properties in her hotel chain. And, and in the area below, just below that, she can see how her property review scores compare to the top competitors in the industry. Now, unlike the other two parts of the reputation section, the guest feedback section is inputted manually by guest-facing staff through the Pegasus guest profile module. Now, Georgette can easily review a running log of what guests are saying about the hotel property she manages while they are actually visiting on site. This section is especially useful for Georgette as she can see a snapshot of real-time guest reviews and address any issues and follow up with guests to ensure quality service. Now in summary, the reputation section provides Georgette an efficient way to check status on the overall guest experience and marketing efforts of her properties by offering a summarized overview of property analytics, social media marketing promotions, and guest feedback. All in one community area and made possible by utilizing external site APIs. And now <coughs> turn over to Nadia for uh, final thoughts. Okay, so you just saw the in-depth overview of the relationship module, which you know didn't exist when we started. This was kind of a new thing that we were coming in, um, and comprised of its you know three major sections: the announcements, the events, and the reputation section. And as it stands now, the relationship module um, is a way to have centralized communication channels throughout a property to kind of buffer against these disparate ways that uh, the employees are communicating right now, and hopefully buffer against these breakdowns in communication that are currently happening. Um, it's also a place where hospitality professionals can share events, knowledge, and ideas, and make sure they're always informed of what's going on. Um, and it's also a great place you know, for managers to check up, like we said, on their social media and OTA analytics so they can uh, foresee any potential issues right away and develop solutions based on that. Um, so, you know, the relation <laughs> module, we went through a lot of iterations of it and its features, and um, really what it comes down to is what is going to make Georgette's life a little less hectic and a little easier, because, like we said, it's a very fast-paced industry, um, and, you know, throughout this whole process, a lot, of, most of the a lot of feedback that we got from the interviews and the usability testing had one major theme in common, 
and it's what is what can we do as designers to make their lives a little bit easier uh, through technology and that's really what our goal was um, in creating the relationship module and the other theme uh, that kind of came through is you know what can we do to sort of foster relationships there um, like I said we want to help prevent these like kind of breakdowns and also and like the talk earlier, when you prevent these breakdowns in communication, you kind of help bring people together and, you know, there won't be as much contention between one another, <laughs> so that's what we want to do. Um, and another thing we kind of, a major lesson that we learned here is, you know, we, we tried out different features and different things, and what it really came down to was, you know, how are they going to get in, get in the information they need to kind of get out, because, you know, they're, like we said, their lives are busy. Um, they're really problem solvers uh, in the hospitality industry. They want to get the information they need, process it, analyze it, analyze it, and then come up with solutions. That's really kind of a major role of a manager. And, you know, that's essentially what we wanted the relationship module impact to be. Um, so as it stands now, Pegasus does want to take this relationship module, uh, at least this first version of it, and start implementing it into their hospitality platform. Um, they're hoping to kind of gain the competitive edge of trying to make their user experience of their platform better while also making the lives of their users better in their work experience. Um, so, you know, I think if we can help make our users' lives a little easier, then we've sort of accomplished our goal. Um, as well as hopefully providing some value to the hospitality industry as a whole. And. Um, with that, we would like to say thank you to MHCID. We'd like to say thank you to Pegasus, our partners, David, Andrew, over there. My name is David's here somewhere. Right, over there. Yeah. Yeah, if you have extra questions, please come see us. I know we went, uh, our process kind of glazed over, but there's a lot to it. In the interest of our own hospitality management, I'm going to say thank you to Pegasus you. for supporting these great students in their efforts. And I want to say thanks once again to all of you for, for listening to all of this great stuff and to all these students who did this awesome work over the last six months. So great work, everyone. Please do go and ask them questions and enjoy um, our hospitality, um, as well as uh, go take some pictures with Peter the Anteater. He is here. But before you rush out of the room, I want to invite um, Steve, who uh, is the project program director for MHCID, as well as Hadar, who um, directs the undergraduate version of these capstones, to come up really quickly and just say a few things. We're going to be really brief. Um, Really quick, there is food and alcohol in the reception area, and the mas uh, UCI's ma mascot, Peter the Anteater, is there for all of your picture-taking enjoyment. <laughs> this is our first career conference. I thank you all for coming. Uh, we're having it next year. It's going to be better. It's going to be bigger. Please come back. For any of you interested in uh, doing a capstone project with our new co cohort of master students who are excellent across the board, uh, please contact me. I'll be in the lobby. My email is also on the website. I'll have business cards, et cetera, et cetera. For those of you interested uh, in an undergrad capstone, this is Hadar. Well, thank you. Um, Steve and Jillian are such good friends of mine that they put me <laughs> as the last person between you and the food. <laughs> <laughs> so I promise to be very, very brief. Uh, I see some familiar faces, especially in the back. How many people know me from before? My apologies. <laughs> I'm a professor here and uh, I teach mostly undergraduate courses and the one that was mentioned is uh, the capstone course. We actually have a couple of different project courses for our undergraduates that are all designed uh, around working with uh, companies and emphasis is more on the software development side so they have to follow the agile process usually in two-week sprints. They have to deliver sprint reports, prototypes, user interfaces, and something resembling working software at, uh, at the end of either one quarter or two quarters. We've actually been going at this for a while, even before ICS was a school. We had a, a one-quarter project course probably for at least 20 years now. I know because I TA'd it once uh, when I was in grad school here. 
And uh, so we have a lot of experience. We've worked with Google, with Experian, with Rockwell Collins, with Talis Avionics, and lots of small companies. We also like to give back to the community, so lots of projects with um, nonprofit organizations, charitable organizations, and also within the UCI system, research projects, administrative projects. We've worked with almost every school and every major operation on campus. So it's kind of like a mini-me with the undergrads of the projects that you saw now, uh, preparing them for the real world. So if you're interested in working with me and with the other professors who teach the class, please come talk to me, talk to Professor Denenberg when we're outside with the fun stuff. One more minute and I swear I'll break you. Um, the bus is 5.30 today, not 5, so no one panic. For cohort one, if the bus doesn't come at 2.30 tomorrow, please contact me immediately. You have my cell number. Uh, this week came together with the help of a lot of people. Uh, Mr. Miller, our communications director, has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you. Uh, thanks to all the staff that have helped. On behalf of MHCD and UCI, we thank you for coming. Last but not least, I want to thank Adriana, who fed house.